Where have you been? Right, so welcome to our fourth Dynamics Lectures. So anyone has an idea why we have a bit low attendance today? Sorry? Is it in another building? Uh, okay. <laughs> Makes sense, okay. What was your previous lecture? And where was it? Roscoe. Roscoe. Yeah. Right. Who is teaching Tamil? Yasser? Yes. Right, so I was quite upset that no, it was just two students when I arrived here, so I thought, okay, they abandoned my class. Good. That's enough. Right.
Come on, guys. Hare, 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 bit, hare, bit, hare. All right, thank you. Thank you for joining Dynamics fourth lecture. I really appreciate your efforts leaving another building and running to Dynamics unit. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. But at some point I need to I need to start lecturing, so sorry about this, but I need to start right now, otherwise we will be quite behind our schedule. Thanks again for joining. So Last time on Monday, in our last lecture, we were talking about magnification factor and we told that it is quite an important parameter that we need to be aware of. And please make sure that you are able to express what the magnification factor is. Shortly after, I will try to give you the physical meaning of magnification factor using uh, the data of the solution of our next example. So I hope this will help you to visualize or understand better what the magnification factor is. So now we continue again uh, with the graphical representation of the magnification factor. So. Here you can see the plot, and this is again a quite useful plot, and make sure guys, again, it is a very important plot, very important graph, so please make sure that you are able to draw a magnification factor graph similar to this one. So this basically gives us some information about what the magnification factor is, but at the same time, it also helps us to explain what do we mean by resonance. So what is resonance? You can really, uh, with the aid of this graph, you should be able to, or you are able to, in general, explain what the resonance is. So I will try to give you uh, a video, not this one probably, but I will try to give you an example, a quick, a short video to explain what is resonance. But before maybe, I just want to highlight one more time what is this graph figure is about. So it is a function of, uh, it, is, it shows us the magnification factor as a function of the frequency ratios. So make sure that you understand the difference between different uh, omegas here, different frequencies. Omega zero is the forcing frequency, the frequency of the force that is applied to the system, and omega n is the natural frequency of the system. Okay? So when these two frequencies are equal or close to each other, you see that actually the magnification factor or the displacement of the system is getting higher and higher. At some point, you see it is kind of uh, getting so high, which means in physical systems it can cause some uh, damage or failure, right? So we, this means we need to avoid to have the same or similar omega zero and omega n. Right? So this is a quite important, again, aspect. And please make sure that you are familiar with this process or uh, the parameter, and you can explain the importance of this graph. So now, I used to give the example. I think I mentioned to you in our previous lectures at, one, at some point about a swing. So you gave imagine you gave the first push to the swing and it is swinging with which frequency? It's natural frequency, right? So you pushed one time and let it go, so it is swinging with it is natural frequency, with omega n. So if you keep 
pushing with omega zero, which is close to omega n, which means again, you are pushing when it comes to you, right? So you are kind of uh, impo or super uh, matching the omega zero to omega n, which means that you are actually getting what? Higher magnification factor. Right. So which means that again swing is going higher and higher. So at some point obviously it will reach a point which may which may be quite dangerous. So it is similar uh, concept can be applied to uh, machine components and machine parts as well. Right, so let's watch one video now and try to talk a bit more about on resonance. And we will have a quick, uh, short discussion about this as well. So now we are going to watch a kind of a very expensive experiment, but obviously uh, due to the importance of the vibrations and understanding of the resonance of the systems, it works. The testing, and we will have a quick uh, discussion session afterwards. Uh, which helicopter is it? Thank you. So try to understand what is happening. What is the omega zero? What is omega n here? And how? What happens when we get resonance? View. Now you see the same helicopter. So test it to destruction. So you have a brief kind of explanation what is happening here, ground resonance it is called. Uh, now I would like you to please, for just, for just one or two minutes, try to think and discuss. Because we are, we are talking about omega zero and omega n. What is omega n here, natural frequency? What is omega zero? And how come we are getting resonance? Somehow omega zero should get close to omega n. What's happening? So please try to uh, think maybe first, like you know, a couple seconds, and then try to discuss with the person next to you, and then we will continue. What do you think is happening? If you are not discussing yourself, I am coming and asking to you. Sorry. I am, I am asking the question now, right? So, don't uh, throw. So, my question was, what do you think is happening now? You can, but I'm just trying to understand, like, what do you think, what's happening here? Yeah. Frequency and, uh, force frequency. So what is the natural frequency of the system? Like, you know, what, what do you mean by this? Uh, I know the force frequency is from the, the blade of the helicopter. Right. The and also from the touching the ground. Yeah, yeah. So the helicopter is kind of held to the ground. 
this line, yes, correct, yes. That's why it's not Yes. So the blades, if you read this part here, you will see when the blades are getting on one side of the helicopter, they are trying to push the helicopter on that side, right? So this is happening kind of in an oscillator motion, one side, other side, and if this motion kind of makes helicopter a bit like, you know, pull up from the ground, and then the legs again starting the ground, so again, this push from the ground, when it is getting the same frequency with this rotating rotation of the blades, then they are getting closer, so it is kind of uh, increasing the frequency. This is what you mean. Amplitude, definitely. So one time it is maybe this much, but it's increasing, increasing, so... Yeah. So the amplitude, it says it's static amplitude. So what do you mean by static amplitude? Static amplitude means, so there is a force, force in frequency we say, right? So there is a maximum force applied. So you apply this maximum force to the system first, but without oscillation, okay? So imagine this is the mass, and you are hanging it to the system. There is a deflection because of the mass. So this is called static deflection. But the same mass, if it is going up and down, you will get much higher displacement because of this oscillation, oscillating motion. So this is static amplitude to steady state amplitude. So the magnification factor is the ratio. Then. Right. Thank you, guys. So thank you. Thank you for the discussion. I am going to talk shortly about the importance of discussion in our learning process. Uh, but I hope you found this uh, helpful in understanding the effects of resonance. And also, please think about, okay, so what? We saw omega zero getting closer to omega and somehow, and the helicopter getting destroyed somehow. What is the lesson? Like, you know, for why it is useful? Why do you think they made the test? Is it for, I don't know, uh, pilot training? Is it, I don't know, Possible, quite possible. I mean, again, it can be due to different reasons, obviously. So I am sure it is very well planned and the outcomes will have different reasons uh, or they will be useful in different aspects uh, of the design and also maybe training of the staff members, anything. So uh, again, this is quite an important aspect when we are uh, discussing, please also try to understand the overall like, you know, meaning of our lectures anyway. So, let's continue. So, we are talking about the uh, uh, forced vibrations now. Is it correct? Do we have a damper yet? Any damper in the system? We don't have, I believe, so far, right? So, we have only spring mass, and also now we have an external force applied. So far, we just considered the force, but also the system, uh, like the external applied forces that we discussed, it can be also subjected to externally applied displacement. A simple mechanism, again, causing or kind of uh, exerting this displacement, this periodic displacement to our system is called uh, scotch yoke, I think it is called. Uh, so again, this mechanism here, the yoke can be used to apply a periodic displacement to our mass. Okay, so with a kind of careful consideration or, or investigation using the free body diagram of the system, you are able to see that actually this spring, considering the displacement of this mechanism and also considering the motion of the mass toward X direction, you will be able to see that actually this spring is compressed by this amount. So this is a quite important thing but it's quite simple because when you push, this system pushes the mechanism, it is compressing the spring, but at the same time, the mass is moving towards right, so the spring is compressed by this amount only, or stretched in the uh, other half of the motion. So using, again, the same principle that we used before, quite simple way, we can apply the equation of motion and then you can see that 
this equation is the same form as we obtained for the external applied forces, right? So the only difference is that actually if you replace the F0 with K delta 0, you obtain the same equation. Again, you can track back the equation and try to understand why, uh, where this delta K0 comes from. It is simply replacing our force in the previous uh, equations. So it's quite a simple one. So now we are going to solve another work example. Uh, we still go with quite simple problems, but in tutorial sessions tomorrow, uh, you will be able to see some quite, I mean, relatively more challenging questions as well. And I hope to see you all guys tomorrow because I'm going to introduce our GTAs to you tomorrow. And please also check, if you haven't done so far, please check the Blackboard website uh, and see which tutorial group you belong and try to identify the relevant GTA to your group because as I said, there are six GTAs, teaching assistants. <clears throat> so you are now kind of divided into six groups. And in the tutorial session, please make sure that the first group is sitting on the left-hand side, lower part of this uh, row. And also make sure that group two is maybe like, you know, here, upper side. Group three, group four, five. Six. So make sure that, you know, it will, I, I think it will make <coughs> communication easier uh, with the teaching assistants for you. So now let's go over or work out this problem. I was going to work out myself, but considering the time is spent uh, at the beginning, I'm going to just go over on the slides. But later on I will make sure that I'm working out problems myself. So we have an instrument. Uh, it is rigidly attached to the platform P. Again, it is supported by the platform, is supported by four springs. We know the spring stiffnesses. We know the mass of the platform and the equipment. And you can see the platform or the floor is subjected to a vertical displacement delta. So instead of an applied force, we actually have now an applied displacement that we know, and it is a kind of periodic applied displacement, and we need to find the amplitude of the steady state vibration. Steady state vibration. Right. So you remember, I hope, uh, that we, what we told about steady state vibrations in our previous lecture, and we need to find that vibration and its frequency that would cause resonance. So, if we are trying to find something that would cause resonance, what, what do you think we are trying to find? So for getting resonance, our omega zero forcing frequency must be equal to omega, and the natural frequency of the system. So what was the natural frequency of the system? The formula is quite simple, right? Omega n equals square root of k over m, right? Yeah, so I'm going to explain this now, uh, but it is really a great point. So we need to first uh, know that we need to identify the system, what is given, what is available there. So this is quite an important thing. And now, as your friend told us, so we need to consider that there are four springs. So let's start uh, with the solution. So they ask us, the question asks us, we need to find the frequency which would cause resonance. It means that first we have to find out what is omega n, what is the natural frequency, then we are going to find what is the omega n that would cause resonance because we know that the omega zero must be same as omega n to cause any resonance. 
So it is a good starting point to find out what is the omega n, right? So k over m, but since we have four springs here, we take this into account and we find that our omega n is 12.65 uh, radians per second. So this is in the pocket. So you probably got already a couple marks if it was uh, in the exam, right? So because we are take, getting marks for the solution steps that we follow. So now we need to find out what is the, what was asked. So the x steady state amplitude we need to find. So the equation is quite clear. We derived it. We, yeah, it was in our last lecture on Monday. We derived this equation and you can see that this is the function of our frequency ratio as well. And we just substitute the given values and you can find the x the steady state amplitude <clears throat> is 16.7 millimeters. This is fine. But how did we know what is delta zero? Where we got delta zero? And what, is, what, what, what does it mean? What does delta zero mean? So we are given this function, right? So in this function, you can say that it is something like, you know, here we have 10. What could be 10? Delta zero, right? The amplitude of the displacement. What is 8t? What is 8 here? Frequency, forcing frequency, is it? So this is why it is quite important to find out first. Read the question carefully. Try to take notes, important notes, that will help you during the solution process. So this is how we know what is delta zero. So the other question now. What is the 16.7 millimeter? It is the maximum displacement that you can expect right under the periodic function forcing function right so if i would ask you it is not the part of the problem but one question think about this if the question would ask you what is the magnification factor here how would you find it? I mean, this is now just came to my mind. So it is not a part of the question, but just think about this, OK? And when you are thinking about this, I will give you a tip. What is this delta 0? And what is this 16.7? See, I said think about this. No, I don't need answer, but thank you for that. Right, so, and the other question was, Part of the question was, for getting resonance, how, how, how uh, we would get resonance? Again, we know that resonance actually occurs when the amplitude approaches infinity. So when, the, when it would approach infinity, if omega zero would be equal to omega n, right? Simple as that. So if somehow the forcing frequency will be equal to 12.6, then you will get resonance. So I think this is a quite an important example as well. Simple, but they explain quite significant concepts. And after our lecture, you can see question two now. And after today's lecture, uh, the solution of this question will be also available on Blackboard. But please, please try to Solve it first, work out yourself and try to uh, find a solution yourself because answer is given here. If you cannot, obviously, the solution will be available anyway on Blackboard. But take this opportunity as a kind of uh, revision time for yourself. So now, uh, 
We are going to our subtopic, or third subtopic now, which is damped free vibration, which means we don't have any externally applied forces or displacement to our system, but we have a damper. We have a shock absorber in the system, so we are going to analyze uh, and try to understand this kind of systems first, and then next week we will be working on uh, damped and forced vibrations, which will be a kind of uh, the most complicated systems that you can see in the dynamics unit this year. Intended learning outcomes, again, we are going to analyze uh, the single freedom systems, uh, which has a damper, and we will see how to analyze these structures. You can see here the relevant sections of our textbooks. And before the tutorial session tomorrow, uh, I may mention tomorrow this again, but I just wanted to show you the thing, the uh, pyramid, the learning pyramid that I mentioned in the first week. So I'm just trying to explain you why I want you to discuss between you. Why I want you to work out the problems yourself. Why I want you to explain to your friends. As a lecturer, lecturers in general, most of them, we are doing research, we are doing teaching as well. So we need to also try to understand different aspects of our teaching and learning processes and how it is uh, how we can improve it. So, I don't want to undermine the importance of lecturing because it, it undermines my job, kind of, right? In a way. But this is, this is from literature, so this is based on research, okay? So, if this is retention rate, average retention rates, so if only me, if I am talking here only and trying to tell you about dynamics, what is it, what about it? This is the amount that you retain, which means after a month, I don't know, next week, next month, next year, this much of my lecturing uh, you will remember, hopefully. If you are reading the textbook or other materials, this is the amount that you retain. Audio, uh, audio visual. This is why I am trying to give you some example videos, for example. If you see and if you relate it in your brain, if, if you construct the knowledge and information, again, this is increasing your retention rates. And demonstration. This is why I am trying to give you some examples. I'm going to work out myself as well later on uh, and try to demonstrate to you uh, and also, a demonstration is also part of the videos that I'm showing you guys. So I'm trying to demonstrate the real life examples of the course content discussion, you see. I mean, I think it's about like 60, 70 percent, something like that. So retention rate increasing when you discuss. It is really important, as I said, when you discuss with your friend, you are learning much more than what I'm talking about or retention rate. Sorry. Practice doing, again, getting much, much higher, right? It will if you try to solve the questions now by yourself and try to teach to your friends or try to do it together, it means that you will be ready for the exams when the exam time comes. And I mean, not just for exams, but in real life as well. You will retain more, okay? So I just wanted to give a scientific back or base of our discussions, our video uh, recordings, whatever. So now, uh, this section, subsection of the lecture is about, as I said, again, we have a vibrating system, but this time we have a simple damper in the system. You will see that it is a quite simple process because in addition to what we learned before, we are just going to add a simple damper in the system. That's it. So in general, you know, if you, uh, I mean, I think most uh, obvious example is the suspension system of the car. So you see dampers or shock absorbers, whatever. So you feel, I'm sure, that uh, vibration or shock 
absorbing capacity of the uh, dashboard or <coughs> Right. I think here the most important thing, we, we may use like, you know, water, oil, air, whatever. Like there are different types of now shock absorbers. But I think the most important part is to know that uh, the resistance to motion is directly proportional to the body's speed. This is a very important part. So if you are pushing slowly the damper in your hand, you will feel a reaction force, but it will be relatively low. If you try to push it harder, you will see that the reaction forces are getting higher and higher as well. It is proportional to the velocity. I think this is the main idea that we need to understand when we are analyzing uh, this type of vibrating systems. But I think I have another uh, video about this part, but let me explain a bit. Uh, tell a bit more first before the video. So the viscous damping, damping force, we express it by C x dot. x dot means velocity, right? And here you can see the force is proportional to the velocity of the system, as I explained earlier. And we call that C, coefficient of viscous damping. And the units are quite important, Newton seconds per meter. So simply in the system, in the mathematical system, we just add a simple damper or dashboard, whatever it is, and we need to give the proper sense of the force in the free body diagram. I think this is the key. Now I just want you to think, you don't need to answer, but if your system, if the mass is moving towards right, what, in which direction you would get the damping force? Would it be towards left or right? Your mass is moving towards right and the reaction force should be from damper left. Correct. So I think this is, this is the point, guys. So, I mean, there is no need to complicate it more. This is the only thing that we need to know about this issue. So we are going to talk about how we derive the uh, governing equations. But first, I believe we have another uh, good video that we can talk about. Uh, I think shortly we can just have a quick look about on this video. It is about London Millennium Bridge that I talked to you in our previous lectures. So this is just after the opening. The this is the As opening the people game. poured over the bridge, it was clear something was wrong. The bridge was wobbling from side to side. I got a phone call in the day saying we had a problem and uh, my first reaction was the same as everybody else's well all bridges move a little bit there's an exaggeration going on but but uh, roger said uh, no no this is this is real and so i came down early afternoon and you saw it and you think this 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 isn't real this can't be happening it was uh, very disappointing uh, we were witnessing the bridge performing in a way that we hadn't anticipated. We'd done lots of work to try and understand its behavior. We felt that we understood it very well. And here it is doing something completely unexpected. And vibrations can affect a bridge. They are giving similar example anyway, but uh, the point here is guys, uh, what is happening is resonance. Arab's calculations followed the codes in assuming that people walked randomly and the major force they generated was vertical. Important observation. We also observed... So the point was, the bridge itself had an omega n, natural frequency itself, and the frequency, the forcing frequency of the people when they were walking on the bridge it just coincided with the 
natural frequency of the bridge. So this is the main point, but it is quite surprising as the uh, engineers also told us, it, is, it was something that they didn't expect and they spent quite a lot of time on analysis and design of the bridge anyway. So about dampers, I'm going to give you another example. Uh, so it is about the dampers and how they work. It consists of a piston inside a pressurized cylinder with fluid that travels between two internal chambers. This works similar to how shock absorbers on your car operate. As a building moves during an earthquake, the damper piston forces fluid from chamber to chamber, converting the dynamic energy into heat energy, which is absorbed and dissipated by the damper itself. The effects of an earthquake on a building with and without dampers can be very dramatic. The transference of energy through the damper fluid minimizes lateral movement and stress on the structure, which can lead to collapse. Dampers are configured in a variety of ways to accommodate different loads, building sizes, and shapes. Each building has unique characteristics. Proper positioning of the fluid viscous damper is key to achieving the desired safety level for a structure. The cost of implementing this type of high performance engineering can be very affordable with great improvement to the building's resiliency. Well, again, we are just mentioning here as a simple kind of uh, damper or dashboard, especially in, like, you know, in buildings. As you saw, the effect was quite significant. Uh, so, I'm not sure if you are aware, but uh, there is a kind of now a kind of disaster in Turkey about the earthquakes, uh, and it is quite uh, heartbreaking to see that you know that that kind of simple, uh, relatively simple mechanisms could save lives. So, again, simple on the paper, but they have direct relevance to uh, humans lives basically this is this is uh, quite shocking and i think emphasizes the importance of uh, what we are talking about now right here is the free body diagram and the only additional force here you can see our mass is going towards right and this is the viscous damping force from the from the damper so the only thing you need to take into account in our equation of motion, just this section, C times velocity. And our differential equation, second order, and we know that from our uh, advanced mathematical courses, we know the solution is in the form of E over lambda T. So, by doing some extra calculations and some substitutions, you are getting, you are finding a really kind of familiar equation to you guys. I, I'm sure, like, you know, this is, uh, this is something you are quite familiar with from high school or secondary school, probably, I think they are teaching that. Quadratic formula. So, we call this a characteristic equation because based on this characteristic equation we are able to see whether our system is under damped, over damped or critically damped system. So this is why we call it uh, characteristic equation. So for going forward we are using some of our uh, standard Parameters like omega n, we know this is a natural frequency of the system, and we say it is undamped natural frequency. It means, I mean, we are highlighting this is undamped natural frequency, which means that later on we are going to see something called damped natural frequency as well. So you need to be aware of the difference between them. And there is something new to us now, because this is the first time we are talking about damping, so we are talking about critical damping critical damping uh, factor or critical damping coefficient. So this critical damping coefficient CC is the value which makes the radicals in the quadratic, quadratic equation 
equal to zero. What is radicals? So this part, we call it radicals in the equation. And the critical damping coefficient is the value which makes this value, this uh, radicals zero. So when you see that, you are, it is quite simple to find out what is the critical damping coefficient CC is equal to 2m omega n. The good news is that, you know that with purple background, it means that you are going to get this equation. It will be given to you, so you don't need to know it by heart. You don't need to remember that, but it's always good to understand uh, how we get it, where we get it, how we drive it. I don't expect you to drive it, but pay attention, like, you know, how, how we got it, how we uh, drive the equation. We will hear a lot about critical damping coefficient, and also please check previous exam papers, and you will see, I mean, several exam questions on vibrations included critical damping, uh, critical, critical damping coefficient as well, so this is a quite important concept. So, based on this, or on, in addition, we now introduce you a new parameter, viscous damping ratio. Uh, we denote it or indicate it with zeta. I think it is zeta. Do we have any Greek friends here? I think it is zeta, anyway. Or xi. Okay, good, thank you. So, this is, again, a quite, quite important parameter viscous damping ratio. It is the ratio of the C that you have in the system to the critical damping uh, coefficient or ratio. So when again we, are, we use it and do some different uh, substitutions, we are going to get three different possibilities based on the equation and our solution or our parameters like parameters of like C, for example, damping coefficient, right? We may have three different systems as overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped systems. The good news, it may sound quite complicated, but you will have, again, all different equations related to all different three cases. Your part here, you need to decide, you need to be able to evaluate in which category the given system belongs to. So you have to be able to determine whether it is under, over critical or under them. So if, the, if you find that system is over them, here is our equation again given to you. If, maybe one thing that I, I think I will mention this later on anyway, this is also a non-vibrating system, but over them, so it is reaching the uh, point of uh, equilibrium. Guys, someone pushing there, everyone looking there. They can wait. Right, it is going to equilibrium position a bit slower than critically damped case. If our system is critical, as you can see, our zeta equal to one, then this is our equation. This is representing, in general, the optimum case that we want. We will discuss why we want critical systems in general. And this is, as I said, this one is over damped system. This is a critically damped system. You can see this is our kind of uh, getting closer to equilibrium position, so this system, over that system, comes to equilibrium position again, but it takes relatively longer time because this curve will come to the point of zero equilibrium position quite later than critically damped system. So both are non-vibrating. When you leave the system, they are not, none of them going beyond the equilibrium position, 
but one is getting equilibrium position quite closer. So this is a very important point that we are going to talk about in our next lecture. If the system is under them, again, equations are given to you guys. And this time, remember, I told you before, we have a damped natural frequency. Before uh, finishing the lecture, I am going to highlight one very important point, what you need to know. The thing, again, you need to identify whether it is over damped, critically damped, or under damped. After that, you see, I am giving you only the displacements, x. Solutions of these questions generally requires time derivative of these displacements in order to get velocity and acceleration. This is something that you need to uh, be capable of, and I'm sure you are. Uh, and also, please check our previous exam papers and try to understand what kind of questions we get. Thank you very much, and I'm hoping to see you all tomorrow, guys, for tutorial. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's any y inside the interval c to d. Yeah. So, you know, if you take c, c to d to be you know, minus 10 to 10, yeah. then the solution leaves minus 10 to 10 quite quickly. Yeah. So then it, you're not. It's still there. You're still there. It's still finite. Yeah. It still all works. So I don't look at the solution. Never mind the solution. I just want to know if it exists using the Pino's theorem. Yeah, and because the function, the function derivative with respect to y is contained.